Italy was a troubled nation after World War I. Remember, the Treaty of Versailles had given away land the Italians expected to own. Remember, across the Adriatic, much of that territory became the new country of Yugoslavia. In addition, war veterans couldn't find jobs, trade was slow, taxes were high. Inspired by the Russian Revolution, workers held strikes. Landowners and factory owners were scared of a communist revolution like what had happened in Russia, happening there in Italy. And in the midst of all this, government leaders argued over what to do, and people looked at the government and viewed them as powerless. In the midst of all this unrest, Benito Mussolini took advantage and came to power. Mussolini was the son of a socialist and a religious school teacher. Initially, he himself was a socialist, but later he felt that extreme nationalism was the way to overcome class struggle. During World War I, he had been a newspaper or, you know, newspaper reporter. He had actually run a newspaper. And he was used to using propaganda to spread certain messages in his paper. In fact, it was revealed just a couple years ago that the British Secret Service had been paying him under the table to promote the idea of Italy remaining in World War I when the war became unpopular and it was feared that Italy may no longer be an ally of Britain. In 1919, Mussolini got together war veterans and a lot of other unhappy Italians, and he started a political party called the Fascist Party. They take their name from this symbol of authority in ancient Rome called the Fasces. It was a bundle of sticks that was wrapped around an axe. Now, why take a symbol from ancient Rome? Remember that Rome is in Italy. And Mussolini spoke about reviving the Roman greatness that the Italians had once known. Fascists promised to end unemployment, promised to gain more land for Italy, outlaw rebellion, and eliminate all threats of communism. Mussolini had a band of soldiers that were known as the Black Shirts. Here they are, dressed in their black shirts. They broke up rallies, they broke up unions, and in many cases they would just take over for elected officials. In 1922, the fascists marched to Rome, where King Victor Emmanuel III was so afraid of an all-out war with the fascists, that he capitulated and made Mussolini prime minister. Most Italians, quite frankly, didn't care because at that point they'd already lost faith in the government anyway. Ultimately, the fascists gained other cabinet positions, and within a couple years, by 1925, Mussolini had taken the title Il Duce, which is the leader. And he turned Italy into a totalitarian state. This painting by Diego Rivera shows just how many people were willing to look the other way as Mussolini was rising to power and turning Italy into a totalitarian state. His tactics and strategy won him the admiration of Hitler, who was rising to power in Germany shortly after Mussolini had taken control in Italy. And certainly Hitler, you know, watched Mussolini's strategies and in many cases uh, copied some of the same things that he had done. Later on, the two form an alliance. And then one of the first things that Mussolini does when he becomes leader in Italy is 
he invades Ethiopia and once again claims Ethiopia for the Italians. If you remember back to the scramble for Africa, Ethiopia was the one place that resisted colonial rule. They fought back against the Italians and defeated the Italians. And this was a source of embarrassment for Italy. And so Mussolini takes over Ethiopia. And in fact, one of the things that he does in order to kind of show uh, pride in, in this conquering is he took this ancient obelisk, this obelisk that was thousands of years old from the ancient kingdom of Aksum, where Ethiopia um, was, was once. And he took this obelisk and he puts it in Rome for all to see. And even though Mussolini was defeated in 1945, and even though Italy sort of agreed uh, per United Nations order to return the obelisk in 1947, the obelisk was not actually returned to Ethiopia until 2005. They took this huge obelisk apart in three big pieces, and they carefully uh, brought it to Ethiopia where it was painstakingly reassembled. And the whole thing was actually a three-year process. It started in 2005, and then it wasn't until 2008 that the obelisk was back up and on display in Ethiopia after all this time.